This podcast is a member of the Voices of Wrestling podcasting network. Visit VoicesOfWrestling.com to hear the rest of our great podcasts, as well as show reviews, columns, opinions, and updates across the world of wrestling. This is Everything Elite, presented by MyBookie, the world's best podcast devoted exclusively to all elite wrestling and the elite extended universe. I'm Aaron. I'm joined, as always, by my good friend, Mike Spears. What's up, Mike? Hey, y'all. It's your old pal, Iron Mike Spears. I'm doing all right. You know, uh, as we were getting in free pro, I've had two chocolate croissants early in this morning, so I am pretty caffeinated as much as one can be and i'm ready to go you know it's uh we're recording this on thanksgiving morning and it's been real interesting because our setup everyone's doing uh virtual thanksgivings and we're kind of flying by our seat of our pants here so yeah. i'm doing all right how are you ab uh, i'm doing well uh kentucky got back to playing basketball last night that's pretty much all i need to be happy in life <laughs> so who was it against warhead state Okay. Okay. That's. A, I, I figured it would be a school I never heard of. I've heard of Morehead State. Yeah, local Kentucky school. So uh, it was nice. We beat the spread. You know, it's all that matters. So uh, that was good. Nate on this Thanksgiving is on assignment, but for episode one hundred, the centennial is that right? The centennial episode of Everything Elite, we are joined by the prodigal podcaster. That's right. It's everybody's favorite Aaron. At Aaron Tal. What's up, buddy? Not much. It's it's so good to be back on the show, Aaron. I was looking. It's my first appearance uh, here on Everything Elite since October of 2019, more than a year uh, away from the show. I'm so thrilled to be here coming to you live from the People's Re- Republic of Astoria, Queens, New York. Um, <laughs> and just uh, Thanksgiving Day. I'm fired up to talk about some wrestling with my friends. Uh, thank you so much for having me. Yeah, I think you were last uh, on the show when we were all at all out right yes yeah 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 like before this was like a i guess like a real weekly television show um yeah we were all in uh where were we chicago i guess and yeah we, or hoffman we, estates that's right and we did the reaction show from uh was it mike's hotel room somebody's hotel room it was not mine because remember hotel room. Yeah, because mine was the really sad uh, divorce dad's extended stay I stayed at. <laughs> right. And I was like, I don't want to put anyone through like this level of depression. So I think it was, it was one of y'all's in that hotel, though. Yeah. Not, not, not at my divorce dad special. Yeah. The, the weirdest hotel room I've been in my life. Good memories of like uh, traveling, seeing friends in person, <laughs> watching live, live, live entertainment. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, man. I Good don't know. I, I'm like back into AEW now. There was a moment, there was a bit like right after the pandemic started where I just, I felt like it was so hard to get into the no crowd wrestling because it just felt like, you know, it's like, is this even wrestling? The, the live crowd is such a huge part of it. And, and also I was, you know, working on a state assembly campaign that was just very consuming. And the combination of those two things really just like knocked me out of it. But now that like the crowds are back, you're like, oh yeah, this is a, this is like just a great, it's like a, just a solid two hours of wrestling every week. And um, I feel like having the crowds has really helped it. And I'm like, really, I don't know. It's like, I got to figure out how to get down to, to Jacksonville at some point or something. <laughs> you know, I'm, I'm jonesing for the live wrestling experience again. Well, if you're jonesing for uh, more of our takes, you can follow us on Twitter at everything AEW. I'm at Aaron like the car. Nate, of course, is at Epitasis. Mike is at Fuji Heya. Aaron is locked, but he's at AP Tab, so I don't know if he'll let you follow him or not. If you seem cool, I try to. Um, I try to, and I follow back. When now, when I let people follow me, I always follow back. Oh wow, uh, it's my new thing. Uh, I follow back in his yeah. Bio. Hashtag I follow back. Follow back crew. Um, you know, I think. Well, I got it. What? How was I got a? I got a job. Job. So I used to be a freelancer where no one really had to like claim me. Um, whereas now I have like a full-time job and so I have one employer. And so theoretically could be construed to be like a representative of the company in some ways. And, um, you know, I just, I don't, 
like really want them to see, you know, a string of tweets complaining about, you know, the working families party or Joe Biden or whatever I'm mad about, or just like, you know, totally, um, you know, incomprehensible tweets about pro wrestling or FIFA or just, um, yeah. Trying not to get fired. I, I mean, I respect. <laughs> yeah, that's my that's my big thing. Trying to try not trying to keep you know my it's a great it's a great job and I'm trying to keep it and uh, do a good job and uh, you know now I've gotten really into soccer lately so um, you know it used to be that if I did an inscrutable tweet everyone was like oh I don't know what this is but it must be about wrestling but now it could also be about soccer and that I think makes the account even more inscrutable. So <laughs> check it out, AP Tab. Uh, you know, enjoy the takes uh, if you can. You know, follow me if I let you, right? <laughs> All right. <laughs> uh, make sure you subscribe to this podcast because sometimes people like Aaron Tab will show up and you want to make sure you get that in your feed as quickly as possible. If you use the Apple Podcast app, give us a five-star rating and a review. Tell a friend about the show. And if you want to support the show, uh, the best way to do so is to go to patreon.com slash everything elite and subscribe. Okay. Uh, even though it, the crew is a little different today, we're going to do uh, the same damn way we always do it, baby. We're going to kick off this show with elite or delete as the returning guest AT. We're going to start with you. So tell us now, if you're not familiar with the conceit of this, I was uh, the show. <laughs> This is just a bit, you know, I'm just, uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. I know it's been a while, but yeah, I explain the yeah, uh, yeah. elite or delete because it's a very, it's an inscrutable idea. You yeah. Know? So uh, you're going to want to tell us what your favorite thing from the show this week was, AT. Yeah, I think for me, the elite thing, and maybe this, this might be the last time we get to say this, at least for a really long time or for some time, but, um, you know, elite John Moxley world champion, right? This guy just. I mean, I know we, we talk about it. You talk about it a lot. We all talk about it in the discourse. But, you know, he might be losing this belt next week. And I think that and just to take a moment and really appreciate what a reign this has been to this point of just like this guy will be like sort of like the canonical or for people who are watching the show now, like I think John Moxley will we will look back at him as like a sort of like canonical champion, right? When you like think about certain titles, you think about, um, a wrestler who was like the guy or the woman and they carried it and it was on their shoulders and like they were the best. Right. And I think about, you know, Samoa Joe is sort of like as, as a teenager growing up, like the canonical ring of honor champion, maybe for you, maybe you're a little older and it's a Nick Bonkwinkle or a Ric Flair. But I feel like <laughs> if you look at this John Moxley reign, um, he hasn't lost, you know, he hasn't lost a singles match this whole time in AEW he is so believable as just like this down and dirty, you just like badass ass kicker, whatever you want to call him. Um, and it's like not really a character archetype that I even really feel particularly um, drawn to generally. Like I, you know, Stone Cold is not like I like Stone Cold, but I was not like he was not someone who I felt like a sort of like a kinship with or, or really attached to. But John Moxley is just so believable in this role. There's like just enough humanity that you feel like um, you connect. I mean, I thought that the promo, getting back to sort of what what I liked on the show was, uh, I thought the promo tonight or last night was just terrific in terms of um, just the energy he brought to it. I loved when he he was talking about you know building up this match and just cut himself off to be like you know, oh my God, I love this shit, right? And that really, I was like, yes, I love this shit. This is pro wrestling. This is a champion who has carried himself with believability and 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 poise and and swagger for, for I guess, what, over a year now? It's been a year since I've held this title. And you're just like, you're, you're just like, uh, and now he's fighting the other best guy in the company. And this is pro wrestling, baby. This is fucking it. And so I just want to take a moment to appreciate what has been a really excellent performance as champion from John Moxley. Yeah, he's so good. It's something that even as someone that has kind of followed John Moxley since he came into prominence with Dragon Gate USA, shout out to Gabe Sapolsky, really shout out to Lenny Leonard, the absolute god. But 
he's doing like his the best promo work of his career like last week like talking about being one of the good guys getting beat down and then immediately going you can't kill me if you want to find someone to take me out let me call someone with this he pulls off like this idea of like the badass champion baby face in a way that's very hard i think it's easier to be a heel in 2020 than to be like a baby face but like you have this guy who is just like it's not that he's like a corny baby face he's like kissing babies shaking hands it's just like he comes off as a guy that's like no this is our champion this is as much as cody has the ace tunnel this is someone that like he put the company on his back when it entered a very difficult time i mean the time of covid with everything having to wrestle jake hager i mean not a fun time for him and he's done it with aplomb and you know it's something where i i like the feeling at the end of a title ring and i'm with you i think that this is the end of the title ring that when you do like the hand off the next champion like the whole idea of like raising the belt's value and leaving it better than you started and just like feeling complete and i feel as much as i would love to see moxley continue because i feel like that there's a lot more interesting stuff he can do as champion this title run feels complete and this promo that he had here and just like him just taking out Kenny Omega behind the scrim and dragging him to the ring, playing him with a, with a paradigm shift on the belt, cutting a promo, signing the contract, shaking Tony Schiavone's hand was just like one of those things I was like, hell yeah, this is the John Moxley I love. Like he, the, 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 he's doing what he's doing best. And it's just hard to like, not love this guy as a champion and see what he's done for this title reign. Yeah. My original take like before they started this or not before they started but before tv started was like okay jericho is going to win your title and then jericho should put over kenny omega because he's kind of like handing it over to the guy who hasn't been made as a national tv star and of course then the moxley thing happened and that made a ton of sense like that really worked out but i think it's almost better now that as you were saying mike the title has been elevated in a way the title feels more valuable now so for kenny to beat Moxley, I think will be even better than it would have been for him to have beaten uh, Jericho, you know, back when Moxley did. So I think uh, you're both right about that. I also, uh, it's funny, AT, I know we just, Mike and I just did a, a This Is John Moxley episode on the Patreon. So if you want to hear a deep dive into his career, go check that out. And I think it's interesting. What I discovered from uh, watching a bunch of his matches in a row was that this is a guy who I think is a great pro wrestler. And yet I'm not sure he's great at anything like inside the ring, but there's something about his whole package that kind of like brings it together, but he's not like a great striker or a great submission guy. Uh, But he's just got that aura, that charisma that really pulls it together for him. And I think that he is like a really as a result of that presence. Yeah, I was, I was listening. I was enjoying him about halfway through. I need to finish. I'm like at the Jimmy Jacobs match. I got to like finish the, the rest of the show. It's, 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 I was really enjoying it. Um, but I feel like he is a really compelling in-ring wrestler because like like and I think like like, you know, the the work in that G1 that he wrestled was like he was the best guy in the tournament and that, you know, just as a wrestler, I thought. And so I think that like even if the strikes are not like perfect looking strikes, like even if the, you know, the DVR forums would be like, look, this is just not the Jerry Lawler <laughs> shit. You know, these punches are, you know, not that good or whatever. Right. Like, um, I, I just feel like, um, yeah, like just what you said basically about, the, but I think he is like a great, what I'm trying to communicate is that I think he is a great in-ring wrestler as well, because I think like when, the intensity and the believability just like you buy in and you're like, this is fucking, this is great. Like, I think all of his main events have been really strong. And, um, and I, I don't think Kenny Omega is going to be as good a champion if, if he beats him. Well, wow, Hot takes coming in early from, from AT. So I guess we'll see. We'll have to have you back, you know, in a hundred episodes to decide whether uh, Omega was as good a champion as Moxley. So yeah. uh, Mike, buddy, uh, what was your favorite thing from the show? I mean, I think it's time that we need to recognize the FTW lifestyle. And as much as Taz wants them to recognize the FTW world champion, I just, it, as as much as I've really enjoyed uh, Ricky Starks and I've tolerated Brian Cage and 
past rejuvenating his post wrestling career over the last like year and then adding Hobbs, everything kind of came together for Team Taz last night. Like Team FTW now feels like a force of we had powerhouse Will Hobbs just absolutely come out, look like a boss, wearing the orange singlet, having like the old FTW font all over the singlet, absolutely just destroying Lee Johnson. And then Taz and Cody, the whole promo between Taz just like showing his grievances and having it be like legitimate grievances and and making it that makes sense why there is such a chip on his shoulder and then the interaction they had and the introduction of Taz's son Hook into AEW big fan of Hook Taz I don't know how they're going to refer to him other than Taz and Hook and then a great promo from uh, Ricky Starks last night just to kind of capitalize it and very quickly Team Taz has be- has gone from like oh they're just attack Cody and Darby nonstop to now they have like legitimate grievances they are cutting great promos between Taz and Ricky Starks and they're just like some of the more interesting people to watch in this promotion right now and that was like my big takeaway I was going for a while I was like oh now we got Taz and we have Cage and we have Ricky and they're kind of just like a group but now like they feel like a full force and it's one of the more interesting things and I think that now with with Hobbs with them it's probably with the exception of Death Triangle it's probably my favorite group going right now in the company yeah I loved that whole segment I thought what was funny I was talking to somebody uh after right after that segment and they were saying like well like why does Taz care so much about like the FTW title like it being respected or whatever and my my answer is that this is the the manlet versus short king dichotomy which is like Taz is the this character of Taz is the kind of guy who like has to feel disrespected about something or he can't succeed at a high level. Right. If he thinks everything's going well, then uh, he's not going to be able to perform. So it's like, all right, somewhere in the back of his mind, he's got to invent something that isn't going his way so he can get fired up about it. So I thought they did a great job of that. I'm a little the only thing I didn't like about this the Taz Cody segment is and we've talked about this before on the show this blurring the lines of Cody being in management it's like okay that's fine and it worked well in this but there will be a Cody promo later where he'd be like I don't know why I can't get a match against this guy or whatever and you're like well you just told us six months ago that you are in management and you can do whatever you want basically you know so uh, that was kind of frustrating but it was built so well and it the end of it was like so excellent to see Taz getting physical, you know, for the first time and uh, strap a Taz mission on Cody. Uh, Ogan, I believe, said that he watched it back and that Cody actually tapped uh, or was tapping, you know, to the to the Taz mission, which is interesting. Taz is like, yeah, just it rocked. I, I'm willing to write off the uh, the weird management thing for now. Yeah, I found this segment kind of confusing, um, not to be, you know, a contrarian, but I guess, um, <laughs> and maybe I'm just like a dumb guy who likes like very like cut and dried black and white stories and just, you know, my brain cannot process complexity, but I just, I'm kind of like, okay, so we have this big heel unit, but obviously Cody was such a prick in this segment in terms of, uh, you know, uh, just being like every HR person, right, and every middle management you know, I hear you, I see you, you know, I'm going to run it up the flagpole. But, and then, so it's like, is Team Taz, is Taz a baby face, but the rest of the unit is a heel unit? I, I don't know. And maybe like, maybe they're, they are beyond that. And at times it's, per- but I, but I also just feel kind of like, um, sometimes like, I, it's like, what am I supposed to, how am I supposed to feel about these people? Right. Or, or like, you know, Cody is always so like, you know, constant like the Rhodes family is constantly sort of shifting between whether you're supposed to 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 like or hate them um and I feel yeah I don't like the stuff where it's like he's a vice president but he's a wrestler but but sometimes he yeah it's just it just like doesn't really 
make a lot of sense. I thought kind of like the work shootiness of, you know, them turning the mics off and stuff was like all kinds of crazy things happen on the show every week. So when you're kind of like, oh, they're turning the mics off or like, you know, this is unplanned. You're kind of like, this is a wrestling show. Everything's unplanned. It's you know, supposed to be organic and spontaneous. So I, I just, I kind of was just like sort of sifting through the layers of like, um, you know, uh, kayfabe was kind of confusing as well as um just sort of trying to place this version of taz and how we're supposed to feel about him inside of how we're supposed to feel about the existing team taz unit um was confusing to me but i did uh you know i thought taz like as an individual his performance you know as a performer his performance is great and i i did really you know i like this segment in a vacuum i guess is what i'm trying to get to like as a vacuum, if you sort of rip them away from the rest of the context of this promotion, I like this segment of like this guy who wants respect and this shitty, you know, middle manager and the guy who wants respect choking him out. Um, I just sort of don't know how it fits into our larger understanding of this unit. Does that make sense? Totally. And it, it's something that with like the blurring the line is something that, that they've done so awkwardly that you wonder if they're ever going to find a way other than saying, hey, this guy wrestles here, but he also works here. Like he works in like like just like be uh, like open about that. But then you bring up like now I'm in I'm out here as Cody Rhodes, the EVP, not out here as the wrestler. And it does it's something that the the blurring the lines is is something that I don't think has ever been pulled off very well when you're talking about like people who like run the promotion where it might has with like blurring the lines and character traits. It and it's something that. It's uh, just like the the whole like shitty HR speak that like in a lot of ways I feel like that's supposed to, to babyface Taz, and then you have the fact that Cody brought up the fact that Taz's son is training with him and not his own son and not his own father, which is something completely different. That's like if you go more towards the personal route, you can completely avoid the whole blurring the lines thing because you're talking about Taz feeling like incompetent or feeling like that. He's failing as a father, and this is a promotion about kids and their relationships with their parents at its heart. And I feel like that that is a vein that's more worth kind of going into versus uh, let's see what the org chart is for AEW. A thousand percent. Yeah. I think we're all likely to see it that way, but I've said for a long time that Cody is like the Elizabeth Warren in this promotion, in that we are going to often see him as a heel. But the people who watch this show ident- are going to identify with him, even if it's in an aspirational way. So I don't think I don't think they were trying to make Cody more heelish and Taz more faceish in this uh, in this segment. It may have had that effect on us, but I don't think that was the intention. Cody is like, I mean, and, uh, Nate and Mike often throw this back at me that like Cody just kind of is an asshole sometimes, and that's in some ways part of his charm. And we kind of just like let it go, you know, and like same with the Young Bucks, right? Like they are, uh, Mike always says this, that they are faces who act like heels, you know? So that's just kind of their whole thing. Uh, But I don't know, you know, most people don't openly fantasize about the fact that like when the HR manager says something shitty to you, you put them in a, in a TAS mission, right? Like I I think, most people are too beaten down to probably have that kind of uh, fantasy. So this isn't even like a stone cold uh, Vince McMahon type type storyline. I don't think, I think we're still supposed to see Taz as the bad guy here. Uh, But you know, maybe I'm wrong. Maybe I'll be uh, proven wrong on that. Got it. I don't know, man. I I can (laughs) sort of see your take. I can sort of see your take as like, you know, the lumpen AEW Terry at the lumpen AEW universe, sort of like watching this, and not thinking connecting it to their own experience or thinking about kind of like the the workplace in sort of a a class conscious way but i also feel like i don't know man when he's like you know what i'll do i'll run it up the flagpole and he says it in such an exaggerated way um i think it's hard i can't imagine i really you know people I just can't imagine people seeing that and not being like, oh, that's like a shitty and annoying thing, right? 
Maybe so. I just, I... It felt so intentional that I see you, I hear you, and I'll run it up the flagpole. Felt like, like such a shit eater workplace manager thing that it, it feels like hard to pre- hard. It feels so intentional that it like couldn't not be. I guess I'm just beaten down from often thinking Cody was like being more heelish, but it turns out to just be like a one week thing. And then they just go back to normal Cody that I'm going to uh, keep my powder dry on this one, I suppose, and and, and let it play out. All right. (laughs) All right. I think I have to pick uh, an elite now. Okay. We've talked a lot about that they struggle after their pay-per-views to kind of build, you know, to the next thing. Like what they kind of just spin their wheels for a long time after pay-per-view sometimes. <clears throat> but when you go through this show and you look at everything going on, you start out with this hangman and John silver match. And there's like this old dark order hangman story that they kind of bring back up. We've got the whole Kenny and Moxley thing. We've got the team Taz storyline. We've got the death triangle and Eddie storyline that they then bring Lance Archer back into even the TH2 top flight young bucks story. That's a little thing that's been uh, percolating. We get, you know, the uh, Anna J and Ikaru Shida, not really so much, but we played in the Anna J and Ty Conti thing. So it's like throughout this show, there are little things that you can sink your teeth into that are building. Uh, and that gives me hope. I know Aaron and I were talking uh, yesterday off the show about like, Man, I wish they would have built this Kenny Omega John Moxley thing for the next pay per view, so you could kind of have stretched this out a little more uh, rather than you know blowing it off in basically a month. So that's unfortunate. But when I look around the rest of the show and the rest of the promotion, I see a lot of things that are bubbling, and that makes me like more excited about showing up to watch this show every week. Yeah, they always have a stew going, and it's something that. I like now that like I've geared my head or geared my brain towards like, okay, there are things that will happen that might seem like that's not going to be acted upon, but we'll revisit it in a couple months. And if you pay attention, you'll be like, oh yeah, no, Lance Archer is sick and tired of Eddie Kingston shooting his mouth off about the Casino Val Royal earlier this year. So now, he, and he's frustrated about being outside the ring. So now he's going to just unload on Eddie Kingston. And that's like a neat way of paying off things. It's a cool touch for gamers. And it's something that I have grown to appreciate, especially like in this week's show. And with like, it's hard not to want to go like one-to-one comparison to how things felt like last year after Full Gear, where it just felt like for the remainder of the year, it was a lot of flailing and just kind of just like, just like waiting that, and not waiting, waiting in the pool, just like trying to wade water and keep afloat, but not going anywhere. But things are going everywhere, and they're pulling up like awesome things for that, you know, that why there is legitimate grievances and grudges, and it's paying off in a pretty satisfying way that there's at least four or five storylines in this company that I'm intrigued in, whereas in the past there might be like one thing that I'm like, okay, this is the thing that I'm getting into. And I think it's something that like everything feels more cohesive and they're not just punting weeks now. And I think that not with them not doing that, that they're able to pull up things like Archer and Kingston. And it just has a more pleasurable viewing experience, which sounds really horny and I don't mean it to be, but it just was, (laughs) it's something that I really appreciate that they're willing to kind of reach back and touch things and let things simmer before heating them back up again. It's been, it's been a really kind of fun experience of watching it. Uh, no ratings talk today because the ratings won't come out until Friday, I believe. Yeah, uh, if they come out on Friday, I mean, usually uh, Nielsen kind of just uh, punts it. But we we did the good. We have not done the bad yet on last night's episode. Oh, yeah, my bad. Also, our listener elite. Uh, listener elite, uh, Full Metal Praxis says, having a pre-match VTR for the women's title. It's a no-brainer they should have been doing ages ago. Yeah, no, I, I thought it was really effective, and I think that they've always had Hikaru Shida there, who is fluent in English and speaks English with a very charming British accent because she watched a lot of <laughs> Harry Potter growing up, and that was the accent she picked up upon. And, you know, it added spice to a title match that was kind of thrown together, and 
really they should be doing much more of these it's a no-brainer as praxis said and you know it was a nice thing and it instantly made this match feel like it had more stakes all right let's talk about the stuff we did not like from the show last night so at what would you have deleted from this episode yeah, so, you know, that, you know, we were just talking about how I'm, you know, a proud alumnus of, of the University of National Champions at Chapel Hill. But I think we got to go ahead and just delete the state of North Carolina from this episode because wow. every time it appeared, it was bad. And I think, uh, you know, the Tar Heel state deserves better. Um, and And it was just... You know, firstly, you got Justin Roberts with the the Kenny Omega intro. He's doing he's saying North Carolina like, um, there, you know, there's a one New Japan announcer who kind of like sings the people's names. And that's just not how the guy said it during the iconic Chicago Bulls entrance. Right. It's like it's like from North Carolina. And you got to like hit it like that. You can't <laughs> sing it. Right. You got to do I was it right. I was trying to talk you into doing it. I didn't even have to. <laughs> pay respects. Pay respects <laughs> to the Tar Heel God, Michael Jordan. Pay respects to, to, to the legendary Chicago Bulls teams. And pay respect to all the 90s kids watching this, right? This is just a bastardization of our collective uh, childhood. And, um, you know, it, the bit doesn't work because you're doing the, the bit works as an illusion. But if you're like bastardizing it, it doesn't really work like he did it right the first time. He's done it wrong subsequently. And uh, I just, you know, I think he should do that. Secondly, um, I'm sick and tired of Matt Hardy. We're all over it. The fact, like, this is just a guy who's constantly throwing things at the wall with with no consistency. Um, he was broken. He's unbroken. He's a heel. He's a baby face. Now he's doing, like, this DDP motivational speaker who you're supposed to not to like gimmick and i'm just i'm just done sammy should have beat him it's not interesting he's out of ideas you know laza malane as as they would say right you just let it go leave me alone and then uh uh thirdly you know ftr is back i had sort of thought that they would be that would be kind of like the end of of their story which would have made sense right they came in here they were champions they got beaten it was time to go. I don't really know where they plug in. And this tag team division is, is so deep, right? We saw, you know, Top Flight is doing stuff. And, and um, you know, the Hybrid 2 is back on TV. They, they've, they've kept, you know, Jack Evans in a box for, you know, months and months. There's so much depth and talent. Um, what do you do with a team that really should be in the middle of the pack, but their whole persona and deal is that they're top guys and they're sort of these like traveling territory tag team champions. I don't know. I'm not really excited to see where they go with it. So, um, you know, North Carolina, I love you, but you're bringing me down. Let the record state that for the first time, pretty much ever, South Carolina is the better Carolina right now. Just letting the record state. Uh, yeah. Um, it's something that like the Omega entrance, like, it is such an homage and it's insane to me like the people who are like oh why are you making that reference no one knows who michael jordan is fuck off everyone michael jordan at one time was the most known athlete outside of pele and the dearly departed diego maradona that is like the dumbest shit in the world every six months wrestling twitter (laughs) has an argument about whether michael jordan is famous and even if you're one of these 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 like little doofus zoomers who's like oh i don't don't remember him i know lebron james it's like do you know who babe ruth is he's been dead for like a really long time everyone knows Babe Ruth. (laughs) even if you don't know remember michael jordan you know from playing on the bulls perhaps you're familiar with the very famous shoe brand, the Air Jordans that people wait online to get. He's the Jordan from that. It's just like, I don't know, man. I just, it's like the wrestling, the wrestling commentary at sometimes is just like uh, totally insufferable, but continue. Oh no, you're absolutely right. As the, one of the sound points that I really want to get for the show, get Tom Sexton out here to say the discourse is just exhausting at all times. But yeah, no, if you're going to do the intro, they should have licensed uh, Polaris by the Alan Parsons project and do it like full on that way. 
because come on if you're going to be licensing stuff for uh from game of thrones you can license uh alan parsons project it's probably gonna be a lot cheaper but yeah met hardy i i really have the belief in there's no way that it could be disproven so i'm going to assume i'm right about this that matt hardy was only supposed to be in AEW for like six months and then COVID hit because he would do like six months and then matt hardy is would become like one of the more in demand indie wrestling uh things doing like and, and not like you're and, and not just like AIW and that bullshit, but like the shows that actually draw, like the like the Northeast wrestling, your big time wrestling, the ones that cater to doing nostalgia acts. He would do AEW for six months, and then he would go do an indie run, and then after the indie run, who knows? He'll probably show up at Impact, or whatever. But with COVID, you know, I mean, there's no none of those places that make money run shows right now, so it's just like we're stuck with them, and it's very uneven, and it's very kind of annoying. Even though the iconic Matt is the best Matt Hardy character he's ever had, especially when you have the the title of love that he gave to uh, Maria and Mike Bennett, but it's just like at this point, it, it's such like a lost cause. That I don't care. And then FTR is bad. I've been saying that for a long time, and I'm just glad that we're all in agreement that FTR is bad and they're bad at cosplaying Southern wrestling. I thought they had a good South little... Carolina forever. I thought they had a good little video on this show, FTR. I don't have any interest in seeing them. But I thought the video was pretty good. Right. Yeah, the video is fine. But I just but now you're going to have to see them. Yeah, I don't want to watch them like wrestle anyone. And I don't want to hear them talk like in in ring yet, yet anyway. Uh, OK, Mike, do you have a delete? Oh, buddy, I do. <laughs> I, I always have a delete. I always bring the delete there. And uh, Jericho and Jake Hager versus SCU and the whole kind of just having to have these this match that the combined age was probably close to 200 within the two teams and then it turning into like a complete schmoz uh mjf getting involved and then other than like mjf in like the next segment like grabbing the microphone and talking first and the look that jericho gave him i just had no use for this on tv it was like it was like a part of the tv show that only this was the only part that i feel like really had a lull here this was like the one thing that like i found myself like flipping on my phone saying if the just, just just playing on my phone to be honest i was, thought i was gonna have something really funny to say there but i don't <laughs> but it's just which is how i kind of feel here fine here you feel like you would have something interesting here but you don't this feud jericho versus kaz next week's gonna suck like, like let's call a spade a spade that match is not gonna be a good time so yeah i, I i'd rather like they go do this elsewhere yeah i mean this was definitely uh scroll twitter time for sure uh, I mean, there's interesting things for Jericho to do in this promotion, I think, but it does feel like he's kind of run out of steam on some of the better things that he was able to do earlier on in his run. So I think they should probably, I mean, I know they really don't want to do this because I, I think they think he drives ratings, uh, but you might just take him off TV for a month or two and then try something again later. Yeah, I mean, I think that this was bad in the way that you just kind of have to accept sometimes things are going to be bad if you have a weekly TV show. Like, I was thinking about this, too, where you're like, well, you know, Chris Jericho can't wrestle main eventers every week. You can't have a roster, you know, in a world where WWE and New Japan are also signing top talent. You know, you can't have a roster exclusively of, like, young in their prime superstars. And some weeks, in order to make two hours of television each week, you know, you got to have a little SCU, you know, uh, Chris Jericho program, you know, it's just like that. That was kind of how I thought about it. Where I was like, this kind of stinks. I'll scroll Twitter, but it's not like, uh, you know, it's not offensively bad. That's a fair point. Uh, My delete may be a controversial take. I don't know. I've seen differing takes on the, on the TL about this, Uh, but I'm all the way out on, powerhouse hobbs as a name just like it's a bad name i don't understand it it reeks of wwe shit like taking away his first name i saw a friend of the show maxwell say actually it's good because nobody wants to watch somebody named will i don't think that's true i mean will the thrill anybody remember him huh oh i remember will clark yeah I mean, come on big draw yeah, former former texas ranger Will Clark. Put respect on his name. That's right. Big draw, Will Clark. So I, I just think that's wrong. I just don't get it. It's like, it wasn't like a 
a thing where it was organically building up. And then they were like, oh, well, we're just going to call this guy Powerhouse because that's how everybody kind of re- refers to him anyway. It was just like we have Will. Then we called him Will Power. Or, you know, you had like the shirts with Will Power. And then it's just like, nope, we're just calling him Powerhouse Hobbs. It sounds like something JR would say every week that would annoy me. But now it's the official branding of the company. Yeah, and it's something that I would have much rather them just call him Hobbs. Like, it's just like, if you're going to, like, have, like, some affectation on him, drop Hobbs and have, like, he's all serious because in, at, in Team FTW, we build assassins. He is Hobbs. And I feel like that would have been more effective. And then you have, it just, like, doesn't feel natural to say, you know? It just doesn't feel like a natural name. Like, it just feels like very out of territory era and not in a good way. Yeah, I agree with. I think the name. I thought the the name kind of stinks. I thought his presentation otherwise was great and convincing. Oh, but, he rules yeah. it. Like putting yeah. him in a singlet was the right move. He yeah, looks style. great. Oh, yeah, he just he looks like a mean guy. Yeah, um, I love this whole group. That's my only thing. Yeah, is like that yeah. name. It kind of sucks. I agree. Okay, cool. Our listener delete. Uh, our friend Drake in the Discord. The good Drake. He would like it to be known. Uh, not the QAnon Drake and not uh, the pedophile rapper Drake, but the good Drake. He would like to delete John Silver not riding to the ring on one of the lawnmowers they bought to own Adam Page, which I think is a great bit they could be doing. Uh, it's a it's an automobile promotion, and I would love to see John Silver. And like John Silver, because he's so little and so meaty, I think he would look funny riding on a uh, riding lawnmower. So nothing to dislike about that. Got to give him a cowboy hat to wear while he's on the lawnmower, too. Just a little cowboy hat. I mean, just get more John Silver on my screen. Whenever John Silver is on screen, I know I'm having a good time. And John Silver on the meat man on a lawnmower. That, that's, that's something that I think could unite this country. So I feel like that they should have done that. All right, well, let's run down the show. Speaking of John Silver, he was in the opening match. Hey, man, Page defeated John Silver with a buckshot lariat. And then after the match, uh, the Dark Order come out came out. Uh, evil Uno said, we're not here to jump you. I know we have in the past, but I have some regrets about things we've done in the past. Uh, I know you have regrets too. And when I look at you, I see a guy who was a member of the most popular group ever, but no matter how many times you tried to leave or escape, they wouldn't let you leave. And if that's not a cult, I don't know what is. Uh, and then he says, Adam, I know you don't have a lot of people to look out for you, but my friends and I are here for you. You know where to find us. So we continue this uh, Dark Order, Adam Page kind of story, but also just like I thought a very good match between these two guys. Yeah, I thought this was a really strong match. I, I sort of missed uh, John Silver's ascent in the sense that I don't watch BTE because I just, you know, just like, I don't know, two hours of wrestling a week is like a good, it's like a good amount of wrestling for me at this point in my life. And, um, and I sort of was not watching the show during, I guess, like kind of the spring and, and sort of early summer and he's he's a delight yeah i thought like i was like oh he's also like a very good wrestler right because you hear a lot about his personality and johnny hungy etc cetera, etc cetera. but you're like oh this was like this was sort of just like a good back and forth match and 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 adam page was having fun out there and um great opener i like when they do like a high speed singles match uh, as an opener as opposed to always kind of doing the, the tags it was, it was nice yeah, it's, they were doing those like 20 minute long tag matches for a long time, like these epic main event style tag matches. So it's nice to see something like this. I thought there was an interesting discussion in the discord during this match about the differences between John Silver and Joey Janela and how John Silver has been able to bring his indie persona over to AW and it succeeded on a big level, whereas Joey Janela hasn't really been able to been able to transfer what he does to television. And I think there's some interesting takeaways to look at. Uh, when you compare those two guys. Yeah, I think if you go back and listen to me on um, either the the episode I was on in October of 2019 or the first episode, one of my one of my first deletes was Joey Janela as as a as a sort of uh, national television star. And I have been proved 100 percent correct. And um, I and yeah, right. Like. Cause the work is good. Right. And he's believable and he hits hard and, and like he could do his, and it was, he could do his little bits in the match. Yeah. It's funny you mentioned that. Cause I felt that this was like 
almost I, when I was watching the match, one thing I thought of, I was like, this is kind of like a PWG match, right? There's like good action. It's, 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 there's, there's fast paced spots. There's a little bit of comedy, but it, but it's not overbearing in a way that like, this is the best version. Yeah. Of, of like, of an indie wrestling match. Absolutely. But yeah, I thought that was interesting. Why, why do you think, what is your analysis of why he succeeded and Janela has not? Well, uh, well, I mean, I'm kind of just stealing takes, but somebody in the Discord said, like, it's clear that Joey Janela is trying to be a TV wrestler instead of doing what made him popular. And John Silver is doing what made him popular, but on a bigger scale. And I think that's really what it comes down to. Uh, you know, you AEW is proving that you don't have to beat out of guys what was what they were good at before they got on the big stage john silver is like one of the best examples of that imagine this guy going to wwe and what they would have done to him before they put him on tv i forget what show i was talking about this recently but ricochet is the best example of a guy who like just did a lot of cool shit and they're like hey how about you don't do cool shit but also you're bad at talking so let's have you talk but not do cool shit (laughs) And they didn't do that with uh, with John Silver. My, I mean, the other thing about Joey Janela is, and Mike was talking about this last night, I think it has to be grappled with, that Joey Janela got over by booking matches people thought were funny and, right. and like making cool videos. And that's like, those are two things, well, because Giancarlo is gone, those are two things he really can't replicate in AEW. Yeah, and it's something that in a lot of ways... Joey Janela did not get over as a wrestler. He did not get over as a promo guy. There was his CZW stuff of Leo Rush that became kind of a topic du jour and was one of the better things they were doing there. But that was more because of the insane stuff that they were doing in those matches. Whereas with Spring Break, those got over because it was presenting wrestling as like, okay, we, we this is the stuff that's engaging to our audience. And that's why... I feel like Spring Break was such a success. And I think if you look at how Spring Breaks have gone since the basically the first two, each one feels like it's less and less. And it's is it so much John Carlos or it's so much the, like the idea of that they caught lightning in a bottle once. And you can't replicate that in like national TV unless Joey Janela is the booker or is and you have like the production team. Like I definitely think I I definitely think that they have one of the better production teams. I mean, you have, you of course have uh, Nick Mondo there, who is one of the more talented production people in wrestling, but you can't replicate that on TV. Whereas John Silver is just John Silver, but just amplified. I mean, he's out there like showing off the guns, being the meat man, just being just an extremely entertaining person. And what is it that people found entertaining with Joey Janela? Because it's not anything really in the ring other than him being a decent plunder brawler it's not anything you can really replicate on national tv and this is further vindicates aaron and i feel like that tal was right here we got to give it up to big treat big treat was right here and i hope that afterwards he's gonna get himself a big treat for being so right about joey janela yeah put it in the big treat was right folder <laughs> i will say that i once uh, i got a lot of blowback for this i said that sean spears beating joey janela was the right call because there was nothing in joey janela <laughs> and there was there was more future in sean spears than joey janela i mean <laughs> <laughs> yeah just saying sorry joey please don't block us again uh okay then we had uh, kenny omega with alex marvez and he did this whole promo about you know the whole the basis of this was the more things change the more they stay the same and he talked about you know going back a year and he had lost this match to John Moxley. And now he's seeing John Moxley's face everywhere on pro wrestling magazines. Everybody's calling him the best in the world. Now you see it kind of shifting back to Kenny Omega, but he knows that he has to beat John Moxley to take that uh, title back from literally title, but also figuratively title of being the best in the world. And then uh, he drops his uh, don't consider it a stipulation, but for one night only, leave the garbage wrestling at home. He tells Mox he wants no weapons. You're just going to have to beat me in the middle of the ring. You might even choke me out, but you have to do it with your ability. Uh, and then he walks away, but he comes back. He congratulates John on uh, you know his, his wife being pregnant. And he says, your childhood story really tugged at my heartstrings, but I don't think your dad was actually that tough. 
In fact, I think my dad would beat the shit out of your dad. <laughs> I just love this Sopranos ass promotion where everything is about uh, your relationship with your father. Yeah, and Kenny had a great promo and then had him like, like go be my dad could beat up your dad. And that was just wild. Like, it's something where, like, everything until he came back out of frame, I was like, this might be one of Kenny's best promos. And then he came back in there and said, Congratulations on the sex and your childhood story. You know, that sucks, but my dad could be a beer dad. And it's just like, Kenny, come on, man. You can't, good enough wasn't, wasn't enough for you there. Like, but I, Kenny is like cutting promos that aren't making me cringe. And I felt like that this buildup has been great. Like, we talked about the Moxley part of it, but. Kenny's brought it as well too. He comes out kind of looking like Ric Flair, and it's a good look for him. And I like how everything is being presented here. Just you don't have to congratulate John Moxley on having sex. We don't need that. Yeah, I can't tell because it's like I, I go back and forth where it was like the um, I th- I think Kenny Omega is just like a totally insufferable guy, and I don't know if I'm like that. Yeah, well, that's how I'm supposed to feel. He's totally fucking insufferable. Like. I thought that like my dad could beat up your dad is like too cute by half, but then I was like, oh well, maybe like and kind of cringe and be like, but maybe the point like maybe that's just like how he resonates with me as a character. He's he's like a, a cringe annoying gamer guy who like kind of had a moment, you know, where it made sense in in New Japan and just kind of around, you know, and there's like a certain sort of person that he's going to connect with, and that person is not me, and you know, I'm. I'm going to view him negatively and that's how I will engage. You know, I want, I really, I'm skeptical of whether it will happen, but I would love to see John Moxley kick this guy's ass. Yeah. That, I don't think that's going to happen, Aaron. Uh, but no, I, I think this is like the best possible for me, the best possible presentation of Kenny, which is like his best approximation of what a normal person is like. I don't think he can do any better than this at pretending to be normal. And so, I mean, I really like this. Uh, I do think I probably grade Kenny promos on a curve because some of them are just fucking just wild. Uh, but I thought this was good. And I I feel like these guys don't like each other and they want to fight each other. That's that's really all I'm looking for. So I like that. Uh, next, we had another uh, Darby video where he lit a car on fire. So it's just he's he likes to destroy things week after week. Uh, this went into Will Hobbs defeating uh, big shoddy Lee Johnson with a power slam. Uh, Taz came out after the match. And here's where the whole thing happened that we've already talked about at length uh, between him and Cody. Let's hear it for, let's hear it for sons. Let's hear it for hook, uh, hook Taz, uh, Taz hook. I I'm still trying to figure out what, what his name will be. Is this but... like a thing that I mean, does, Taz is from red hook, right? Yes. Yeah. Yes. Red hook. Brooklyn, yeah. So I think Brooklyn, Brooklyn? yeah, yeah, Red Hook, Brooklyn, which is a really lovely place to go. It's right on the water. You feel like almost if you go in the summer, it's almost like you're on a a little beach town. Um, you know, you can hit up Sunny's Bar, you can um, you know, hit up uh the Red Hook, you know, lobster pound. You got um gosh, they have this really great place that uh uh that sells like these uh key lime pies, and you can also get the key lime pie um you know uh frozen with chocolate uh you know coating on it and that's delicious you can take it by the water and it's also um you know home to uh state senator jabari brisflor so it's a great neighborhood and uh you know it's cool that taz is from there it is cool uh i mean i'm just assuming it's this hook kid is funny because he's like he went to college and played lacrosse (laughs) it's like the idea of Taz uh, fathering a a lax bro is very funny to me. <laughs> I, I'm just imagining, especially Taz as Taz on Dark, just but like, so you got like the scooper thing there, like and it goes into the net and how does it work there? It's like I want Taz to explain like what does he feel like about his son being a lax bro turned professional wrestler? Like, there's a lot of gold here that they need to mine into. All right, then we saw. Eddie Kingston, he's backstage with Alex Marvez. He's very mad at the Lucha Bros. As basically, he was getting off his grievances about uh, the Lucha Bros. John Moxley interrupted, and they faced off, and he doesn't have to say anything. Eddie says, come on, you know it wasn't me. You know who it was, and you got your own stuff to handle, champ. I thought this was also a cool way of keeping some of these stories interconnected. Like, 
we're probably not going to see another Eddie Moxley match. Obviously that story's over, but we still remember the history that they have with each other. Uh, then we had TH2 defeating top flight on Helico tapped out Dante with the Navarro death roll after the match on Helico was uh, keeping uh, the death roll on Dante and the young bucks had to come out and make the save. Good match. I thought uh, <laughs> we, we yeah. talked last week, Mike, that, you know, we couldn't be too sure about top flight because they were wrestling uh, the best tag team in the world. But I think, I mean, they had a good match and on Helico was part of it this time. So I think we can safely <laughs> say top flight is good. Yeah. Top flight is good. Uh, they are now officially signed with the promotion and, I think they are both the two youngest people under contract. I mean, I know that Dante is 19 and Darius is 21, which is wild and makes us all feel very old, I would say. But, you know, this was like the, the, the kind of match that proved that this was a good investment. And, you know, I think Top Flight will only get better. I I hope that they don't completely just have them just lose everything out there. I think it would be really a poor choice to just have them as like a jobber team when there's obviously something there and you know this is a team that will be it'll be kind of wild to talk about if they take off the way they seems like everyone thinks that they could take off and see what top flight looks like in 2025 what does top flight look like in 2030 because there's a lot of similarities between them and the bucks and you look at where the bucks were in 2007 2008 and pwg and being young boys in dragon gate versus now being by acclamation the best tag team of the last decade and it's gonna be cool to watch them and i think that this was a big like check mark on the list of okay this tag team is something to watch and it's something you could compare and contrast to see how other young tag teams in the promotion kind of have floundered when they've been taken out of the young bucks match so i think that this is a big big feather in the martin's hat and i'm stoked to see how this goes on maybe this turns into like top flight versus th2 versus young bucks and that i think could be really kind of interesting and i you know i i came out of this really pleased and it's, it was easily my favorite and helico match of like the last like <laughs> six years yeah. so uh then we had the ftr video that we talked about uh which led into jericho and hager defeating scu uh, hager pinned chris daniels after jericho hit daniels with a judas effect mjf hit him with uh the the diamond dynamite diamond ring uh, and then after the match, Kaz took out MJF, uh, had a big beat down, all of Inner Circle attacking SCU. Scorpio Sky comes out with a chair uh, and prevents Kaz from eating another loaded punch. So this feud must continue. All right. Miro, Kip Sabian, Penelope had their famous video game segment uh, as they were introducing it. The best friends in Orange Cassidy attacked Miro and Kip. And then uh, they power bumped Kip into a porta potty. This made Miro very mad, and he uh, shook the camera in anger. Uh, the most boring people on Twitter were burying this, so I can only say that it was excellent. It was fine. <laughs> <laughs> yes, he said the phrase "air towel has done yeah, the deal." He did the thing. You uh, you got to give the people what they want, right? Um, <laughs> as they say, uh, yeah. Anyway, yeah, I thought it was. I don't know. I'm not as sold as you guys on on, on Miro, and I'm not as uh, anti-Miro as the harshest anti-Miro people. I'm I, waiting and seeing. I just, I have to fade the uh, the anti-Miro takes. It's just, I have to do it. I have to fade the people who make the anti-Miro takes. It's just, it's in my blood. Uh, then we had the second attempt at the world title contract signing uh, while Kenny was entering uh moxley attacked him as he was doing the the pose behind the scrim as he does uh mox dragged him into the ring gave him a paradigm shift on the title uh and then mox got on the mic and said whoever you hired to attack me did a bad job but now we're even so next time let me know if you want to hit and i will set you up with some guys from philly uh it says the only way that you can be champion is if you dig real deep and become the kenny omega that everyone says you are and this is as aaron pointed out where he said god i love this shit winter is coming uh, it tells Kenny to take your shot. He does a bunch of bullet club. Kenny hand gestures and says, you're only going to get one chance. I have one question here, which I guess is like, are we as the audience meant to believe that it was Kenny who set up the attack on John Moxley? 
because it was never sort of confirmed uh, by anyone other than sort of Moxley sort of announcing his suspicion, right? Do we? Do you guys think that it was uh, Kenny, or do you think that the sort of next feud will for Moxley will you know happen when you know we find out who really attacked him? I think we've all worked ourselves into believing that it was Kenta, right? I, I guess yeah, there could be a will will open. I guess there could be a Kenny X Kenta um, uh, alliance. That could have been it, but no, we we certainly don't know that that Kenny worked this out, but he has not denied it. I think that's, you know, that's an important part of the story. A little suspense. Yeah, I like that. Yeah, I I like that. And as he said, AT, they could easily spin this off into who Mox has next. And I think that that's kind of a nice, coherent way of doing it. I, however, will forever state that I do not believe that this is Kenta because I believe that the forbidden door stays shut because what does AEW have to gain out of it? Maybe it was Rikishi. Oh, Rikishi was there doing it for the family. <laughs> That's the AP yeah. joke of the week. <laughs> <laughs> there it is. Yeah, you know, sometimes you just got to do it for the people, you yeah, know? Yeah, you got to do it for the, for the people. Maybe it was yes. yeah. big um, quiche. We'll get to see some stink faces in AEW. Yeah. It, yeah. Yeah. I mean, what if it's gang? What if Gangrel's coming back? I mean, what if it's Gangrel attacking, and then we get Rikishi and Gangrel? You know that that's a unit I want to see in AEW. Yeah, me too. Actually, now that you mention it, uh, the inner circle was with uh, Alex Marvez uh, before Jericho could start talking. MJF grabbed the mic and called Kazarian a coward for sucker punching him. Uh, Jericho said the inner circle was going back to basics. The fun and games were over, and he challenged Kaz for next week. Uh, then we had the Hikaru Shida and a J. VTR uh, that we talked about before uh, was uh, Ty J talking about how Anna J has been training and improving. Sheeta was questioning Anna J attacking her knee, uh, challenged Anna J to find more heart. This is the shit that I like in wrestling, baby. And then the women's world title, Hikaru Sheeta defeated Anna J with the Tamashi. After the match, Abaddon returns. Uh, Hikaru Sheeta is, you know, obviously scared. When she sees Abaddon, drops the belt. Uh, Abaddon picks it up and licks it. Did you see on Instagram that uh, Hikaru Shida was trying to clean the blood off her belt? Yeah, and she was just like, who does this? Yeah, I love Shida. She's so wholesome. <laughs> She's so wholesome. I thought that this was an interesting match. I thought like this was, like they set this match up in a way that you could tell, like, I know we were talking about this yesterday on Light, AB, about like, could we see this be a thing that, Anna Jay took the belt and ran with it, but they they very much protected Anna Jay in this match and kept it to a very short but uh, condensed story of her dominating her Karushita, getting the kendo stick shot, getting like two deep uh, two counts, and then just getting a Tamashi and losing. And I thought that that was kind of interesting. I feel like it kind of tells you what what they think of Anna Jay right now. Yeah, I bid on the kendo stick shot like I. I, the match worked for me because I like thought Anna Jay maybe won on the on the kendo stick shot, um, and yeah, um, I don't know. Is Abaddon good or bad? Because I feel like I see like a lot of memeing of Abaddon, which like people just typing like Abaddon, which makes me think that she's bad. But <laughs> I have never watched her wrestle. Uh, she's the undead girl, or is it like the the undead girl? I think that's her catchphrase. Uh, She's. We, we haven't seen much think, of her. I mean, she only had yeah, like that's the thing. two matches, Four. I think. Oh, is that right? Like, yeah, because like she had like the the match against Hikaru Shida, like her tryout match, which was right. really weird. Yeah. And then there was like a couple like random matches. And then the match, there was a match that was cut from TV AT because it was uh, oh, Ty yeah. versus her that that the, and then Abaddon caught an elbow to the throat and had to go to the hospital. The throat, so, throat collector. Ty yeah, the, thro- the throw collector, the queen slayer in the throw. I mean, violence is forever. It yeah. is. So. So, yeah, so a natural contender for the AEW Women's Championship. Yeah, so she's had, uh, let's see, six matches total in AEW, and only one of them was on Dynamite. So we just don't know a lot about Abaddon. Yeah, they got to merge, merge their two women's division and just have, like, one good women's division. They uh, should, I agree, they should have a good women's division. That would be a good idea. I support that idea. <laughs> I, I mean, 
I don't know how this Abaddon thing is going to go play out, but I'm interested to see, like, because this could get really kind of, it, it could be surprisingly good, or it could be pretty funny. I would So one way or another. I would love to know who was like, we fucking got to sign this Abaddon. Yeah. I don't know who's behind she, that. She, she's from, like, the Denver in, indie promotion that was booked by uh, Vince Russo for a while. <laughs> like, just out of nowhere and, and she had a contract like, like this was like the one person that like when signed i was like okay L- like she's kind of doing the sue young act a- in a way and who knows i mean she might be good we just can't i haven't seen enough for me to like say definitively she's good or bad but saying the word abaddon is a lot of fun and you can never take that away from me we had the matt hardy video that at has already buried where he's like switching to this new thing where he's like um you know, I survived insurmountable odds, and so I can inspire uh, the plebs who watch this wrestling show. It was very bad and dumb. Uh, Team Taz backstage. Sans Taz. Uh, Ricky says, Cody's crossed the line tonight. Taz had to leave with his son. He says, uh, and I should also say that Ricky is standing there dripped out, and Will Hobbs and Brian Cage are surrounding him shirtless. Uh, our, our good friend and patron, uh, Sean, Sean Thurman said he wanted to delete Hobbs and Cage standing there shirtless in the hotel ballroom. And I just have to say, uh, he couldn't have been more wrong. Uh, I have to neg our one of our patrons now because this was good, actually. Uh, he says, we want to be clear. We love it in AEW. We're paid well, put in good positions, but we don't like Cody. He says Cody begged Tony to cut Taz's mic because he didn't want to be reminded that uh, he lost to them. Uh, then you said the thing about his kid and made it personal. And Brian Cage in... I mean, one of the worst line readings <laughs> you're just never going to get says FTW is the most dominant force in wrestling. Why? Ha- Brian Cage does not need to talk like ever. He's very ever. dumb, but he like looks he's got a great look, obviously. So just like let him beat the shit out of people and not talk, please. Yeah, this but this Ricky Starks is uh, this Ricky Starks is something else, right? He's he's terrific. He's been such a. a, a a real homegrown star kind of, and I know he was on the indies and stuff, but I, you know, kind of went from I, whatever. Right. I'm he's new to me, right. In AEW. And he's just, he's just terrific. I think that he has this, this very like, uh, you know, he's funny, but he's not too funny that it takes away from, he's just, he's hitting that line just right where he's, he's funny, but he's still a shithead, but he's not like, he's not like all the way on the MJF sphere where it's like, it's too much like he's not like quite a chicken shit in that way, but he has elements. It's just, I, he is, and this is just the talkers promotion, you know, just give me, give me a Ricky Starks promo, a John Moxley promo and Eddie Kingston promo every week. And I will just, I will tune in every Wednesday. Yeah. It's real, real smoky mountain wrestling hours. Frankly, (laughs) it's, it's interesting you brought up uh, MJF AT because it is something where like you have like the whole spectrum of heels and you have MJF who's a very try hard heel. Whereas Ricky is just smooth. Like you, like he is someone that you, he comes out here and he just like has like a natural charisma that I don't want to throw the comp on him, this comp on him, but it's very similar to like the kind of charisma that the rock would have like in 98, 99 where he's just out there and it's like, oh this guy's an asshole but he's also the coolest person on on this roster and who wouldn't want to like stand dripped out where you have two absolute meat men right next to you posing in a hotel ballroom for whatever reason like like that's just real dudes rocks hours and it's impossible for me not to love ricky starts like ricky might be my favorite person in the promotion outside of the guy in the main event yeah yeah the main- oh, i'm sorry aaron did you have something on that? Hard, hard agree and that was it i was just gonna validate the take I like, well, we need validation. Uh, this is a, a podcast about a, about a promotion, about, uh, you know, issues with your fathers. And so the podcast also is that. And so we all just require validation. I think that's just how it is. Uh, Mike's dad was in the main event here. Butcher and the Blade defeated Pack and Phoenix. Uh, sorry that you had to watch your dad lose on national television. <laughs> uh, Blade pin Phoenix after Eddie pushed Phoenix off the top rope, and then Butcher the Blade hit full death. Uh, after the match, Eddie DDT'd Pack on a chair a bunch of times, and then Lance Archer came out and cleaned house. Yeah, this was awesome. I mean, 
death triangle being back together and just like coming out and like other kinds of heels like these are more tweener heels but they're just guys who just like collecting i guess skeletons i mean it is fun and then butcher and the blade it's kind of like frustrating that like after all the natural nightmare stuff where like qt got his big win on bunny who was playing him and was fin doming him now butcher and the blade get the win over pack and phoenix which is a little frustrating but i i really enjoyed it and then we had the good lance archer thing tonight or last night and whenever like that happened he did like crazy flying like cross bodies when you have a seven foot guy doing a flying cross body at age 40 like you just have to kind of step back and be like okay that is something and you know i felt like that this was kind of a good way to like end the show and instantly heat up lance archer who's kind of been doing nothing for the last like few months yeah, glad to see him like back in something that matters. And you're also moving Eddie on to something that's important. I like that uh, because he's, it turns out, a very important part of this promotion of like making the show really good. So, yeah, happy with all that. All right. If you are, uh, if you are happy with the show and you want to support it more, please head over to patreon.com slash everything elite. Uh, sign up. We got three tiers. The middle tier, the $5 tier, will get you every piece of audio that we do and every piece of audio we've done over the past year plus. Uh, this week, as I mentioned earlier, Mike and I did a deep dive into the career of John Moxley. Uh, I think it's very good. So I would uh, highly suggest you check it out. We also, if you subscribe, we have a post with links to all the matches that we talk about in the show. So you can watch the matches uh, and join it. Of course, this week, we also did uh, our light show that we do on Wednesday mornings where Mike and I preview Dynamite, review Dark, Nate reviews all the big vlog action from the week. Uh, next week, we'll have another very special show for you on Monday, as we do every week. Uh, we have the Discord. Come and chat with us. I talk about it a lot on the show. So, I mean, there's a lot of fun chat uh, happening in the Discord. So join us. Uh, the month is almost over. Um, so, you know, you might wait until the first to sign up. But honestly, you get everything we've ever done before. So it's still a good value, even if you sign up today. Yeah, we have now well over a hundred shows on there. We Jesus. Do, <laughs> we yeah, we have light weekly, we have this is like which has been some of the more fun stuff we've done. Breaking strong hearts into the Cody verse, uh AB's uh stardom status. Like we just do all kinds of stuff there. It's basically a lot of it's evergreen content. Yeah. So if you're interested in what we're doing and I'm just gonna like put it out there, like this is John Moxley is one of like the uh, favorite things that I've done this year and it was a whole lot of fun talking about kind of the evolution of a guy and you get to see a side of him that we got to talk about a side of him that's not talked about a whole lot and I really enjoyed it. And that side is him doing coke in Puerto Rico. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Him doing coke in Puerto Rico because he has way too much money (laughs) being in Puerto Rico like in 2005. And maybe one day the Aarons will return to the Everything Elite Patreon. When Aaron is not doing as much socialism and yeah, soccer. One, one, one day. I mean, I, it could happen soon. I feel like, um, you know, kind of in the down cycle right now, you know, for those who don't know, New York's Democratic primaries are in are in June. Uh, so, you know, you know, I think, you know, just planting the seed now. Um, just check out Justine Carr. We've got a really wonderful uh, candidate <laughs> out in uh, Northeast Queens. We've, we've done a lot of work in winning elections out here in Northwest and, you know, Western Queens. But uh, now we're we're gonna we're rocking the suburbs. We have a candidate uh, in, in Glen Oaks uh, and and sort of the, the eastern part of, of the borough, running on uh, you know expanding public transit, um, you know defunding the police, um, you know culturally competent senior centers in in in, in the district. And uh, I don't know, I'm really really excited about for you know Justine's campaign. You can check her out at. Uh, JustineCarr.nyc. That's J A S L I N K A U R.nyc. Um, you know, I don't know. Real heads of our old podcast, Every uh, Everything Evolves, know that it's kind of the place where you go to find out about the cool progressive candidates who are, you know, you haven't heard of yet. I think, you know, we were talking about Alexandria Ocasio Cortez in like January of, of 2018, a good five months before she became extremely famous. Uh, we told you about Tiffany Caban before she became, you know, endorsed by Bernie Sanders and Elizabeth Warren. So that's 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 this this week's, uh, you know, hot, hot electoral politics tip. Check out Justine Carr. Um, and, uh, 
Yeah, but but I other other people are running this stuff on the DSA side. I'm kind of uh, I'm kind of like in a like you know organizer emeritus status now, where uh, I just kind of like I try to give people advice when they when when I can. But they they are increasingly knowing more more than I do, and uh, I should have some time to cast. You know, uh, we should we should do an app. Should listeners, you know, put it in the Discord. At 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 the uh, the everything elite Twitter with what what Aaron and I should you know do an episode about. I just want to say we're rocking the suburbs just like Joseph Biden did. Ooh. <laughs> Fuck <laughs> oh, oh, man. Oh. Yeah. So if you want more good jokes like that, yeah. uh, patreoncom slash everything elite. Yeah. A twofer, a twofer. Aaron's That's joke right, of the baby. Week. Yeah. God, it's Thanksgiving. Damn, I've got a, energy. The treats are bountiful on Thanksgiving. Yeah. <laughs> uh, all right, we're gonna just look at next week's dynamite real quick, and then we'll get out of here. Uh, December 2, winter is coming, folks. The men's world title, John Moxley defends against Kenny Omega. There will be a diamond battle royale. I don't really know what the stakes of this are. It's for the ring. Oh, you actually, you get the ring. Okay. Yeah, and it's actually happening a year afterwards. And when everyone forgot, they did this last year (laughs) this time, too. Well, good for them. Uh, MJF is in the battle royal, so you very easily could keep the ring another year. That's good. You should get a chance to retain your ring. I like that. Uh, Britt Baker is going to take on Layla Hirsch in a match that I know I'm looking forward to. AT, I've talked many times on this show about your immediate recognition of Layla Hirsch as a big star when we saw her in Japan. So I just want to give you a chance to take a victory lap. Yeah, man. I was like, I was like, she's, she's, you know, she's the new Brock Lesnar. And uh, I, you know, that was just another call, you know, a guy ahead of the curve, whether it's, whether it's politics, whether it's wrestling whether it's getting into Spurs the year they win, you know, the Premier League title. I'm just kind of um, a trendsetter. And that's that's one of the things people like me. I consider myself um, a futurist, young shingy. Um, and uh, I just, you know, <laughs> the digital prophet himself. So, sure. you know, keep an eye on Layla Hirsch, a future, you know, she might win the AEW women's title. She might step up and win the promotion's top women's title. Uh, the NWA title, I, you know, <laughs> bright future, bright future ahead of her. Absolutely, she might be the person unifying the belt. She'll become a double champ. There you go. Yeah. So, uh, yeah, right again. Uh, we're also gonna have Cody and Darby versus uh, Powerhouse Hobbs and Ricky Starks, and uh, Chris Jericho will take on Frankie Kazarian. So, uh, it looks like other than that last match, another good show coming up next week. Yeah, it looks like a good time. And I'm wondering how they're going to get cringe about Game of Thrones again. <laughs> I think they should do a How to Make It in America episode. Because if you were going to tap into the Time Warner uh, license, there's a lot of ways you can go with this. And a lot of ways that could be a lot more funny. Like maybe a Dream On show. Maybe an Arla show. Arla like, like, really did. would be good. Uh, the Larry Sanders show. I mean, there's ways to Ken- go with this. Kenny is definitely doing some sort of like overwrought um game of thrones entrance for this for this match no doubt hmm. yeah <laughs> yeah <laughs> you're right he probably is yeah the sigh was very good all right well i think that's the show for this week make sure you're following us on twitter at everything aew i'm at aaron like the car nate is at epitasis mike is at fuji hey uh, at is at ap taub uh, subscribe to the podcast give us a five-star rating and a review on the apple podcast app and make sure you check out patreon.com slash everything elite uh, and my bookie. Use the promo code elite to get a 100% deposit match. Uh, for Mike, for Aaron, I'm Aaron. We'll see you next week. 